This is a class on uh, going to be first and second Peter all together. I talked to Brian Stevens and asked him if I could teach both of them two quarters in a row, and he said that would be fine and dandy. <clears throat> you might as well just keep them if you're going to do that. <laughs> so the uh, the sheet that I've handed out to you gives. We had the missionary last week, so I didn't get to start teaching last week, but this is um, hopefully our schedule. I like to keep to a schedule as much as possible. I know sometimes it's not possible, but I like to do that, and it gives you a little information on there. If you would, uh, if you would read 1 Peter every day and you're saying first Peter every day that man is out of his mind I'm a slow reader and it takes me 20 minutes so I've been getting up and also if you go to Bible Gateway are y'all familiar with Bible Gateway anybody familiar with Bible Gateway if you go online on Bible Gateway on your phone or your iPad or your computer you can listen to first Peter and so sometimes when I'm driving in my car, I listen to First Peter. I get it set up, start driving, and then I listen to it. It's about 18 minutes the way that guy does it. But if you will do that, let me share something with you. Peter is an astounding individual, and his writings will change your life. If you will listen to him and obey the things that are given to him by the Holy Spirit, he's absolutely an amazing person. And we owe a lot of the New Testament to Peter and it's um, his two books. I, I love the general epistles, uh, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude. I love those books because they're so different from Paul's writings. Now that I don't like Paul's writings, they're fine, but I really enjoy these other people who were such an influence in the church as well. So if you would uh, listen to or read 1st Peter every day, uh, like I said, it will change your life and your perspective on life if you'll do that. So we've got, um, <clears throat> um, I have a goal, and uh, I don't know if we'll reach it or not, but I always like to set goals, and that is that uh, invite somebody uh, to our class at First Peter. Sometimes if you invite people to Bible classes, it's less intimidating than inviting them to worship. And then they can stay for worship and everything's good. So invite somebody, and it can be somebody who has been attending. Maybe you've looked around in this class and say, you know what, uh, John is not attending anymore in Bible class. You know, go visit John. Call John on the phone. Get him to uh, come back to class. Or you could just invite your next door neighbor. Um, Lisa and I have a next door neighbor. Her name is Anna. I've been talking to her. She and I have something in common. We both had hip replacement surgery. And she's doing her walking now to get back in good shape. And I've invited her and her granddaughter to come to Vacation Bible School and to this class. So sometimes it's just as easy as looking at your next door neighbor to find somebody to bring to class with you. So tell me five things quickly about Peter. Anybody? <clears throat> Pardon? Impetuous he was. Next. Anybody? This is going to be a long class if you don't come up for more. <clears throat> What's that? He denied Christ three times. All right, that's two. What another one? What did he do? He was a fisherman. He was a fisherman with his brother Andrew. What else? Jesus told him to this rock, I would build my church. Okay, all right. So Jesus changed his name. Uh, so he becomes the person that holds the keys that are going to be used on Pentecost and in Acts chapter 10 with the Gentiles. Yes. All right. He brought the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. Yeah. Okay. Good. I have a list of about 20 things here. So I wanted to make sure that uh, you all knew it. Um, he, um, he not only denied Jesus three times, but then he repented immediately and was restored by Jesus as well. Uh, that's interesting. Peter was married. And we know that because Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Okay, so we figured all that out. Peter walked on water. You ever try that? <clears throat> you know, 
get to the swimming pool or to the swimming hole and jump in and say, boy, I'll just walk on the water on over to where my grandkids are over there. It's not happening, is it? You know, you're going to sink down and you better be able to swim pretty quickly. Um, Peter was present whenever Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. He was present at the transfiguration. Uh, he took the ear of Malchus right off. And if you've ever read that segment there at the end of Matthew, whenever Jesus is being arrested, um, you know that Peter is a pretty good swordsman because he didn't take a chop at him. He just flicked the end of that sword and took that ear off. And uh, pretty interesting. And of course, Jesus healed him immediately. And another thing we learned from 1 Corinthians that people don't normally think about with Peter is his wife traveled with him extensively whenever he was uh, preaching and teaching. And we know that from Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. Um, he was a great apostle. Uh, he, his original home was in Bethsaida, Simon and Andrew. Capernaum was the largest town on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. And Simon and Andrew ran a fishing operation. And they also worked with James and John as well. So uh, we know how they're supporting themselves uh, apparently pretty well. At the time, they owned their own homes, and uh, they were. Uh, uh, Peter was married. His mother-in-law lived with him, so they had enough to support the family. So uh, he was a great apostle. Tell me his names. One's easy. He was called Peter. What else? Simon. What else? Cephas. Okay, and what else? Any more? Simon Barjona is his official name. And I want to ask you something. When your mother was mad at you when you were a child, what name did she call you by? My name is Marshall Guy Swindoll. And when I was bad, mama would say, Marshall Guy. And your mama and daddy probably did the same thing. When Jesus was upset with Simon, he would call him Simon Peter. All right, Peter, let's get with the program here. Simon Peter. At the end of John, John chapter 20, he does that three times in a row. He calls him Simon Peter. Uh, so uh, Peter sometimes gets called on the carpet just like we did. And when he did it, Jesus used his uh, full name in doing that. Um, Peter would eventually become the unofficial spokesman or the leader of the 12 apostles. Um, he was given the name Simon Barjona. Uh, he was named after a man named Jonah. Bar means son of, so he's son of Jonah. Or jo Jonah can also be translated John. Uh, Peter and Andrew were followers of John the Baptist. If you remember, Andrew was the one who went to Peter and said, we have what? We have found the Messiah. So Andrew is kind of responsible for bringing Peter around. Uh, Peter, Andrew, and James, and John were close to Jesus. That was kind of a foursome that was close. But there was an intimate group, core group, of Peter, James, and John who got to witness things that other apostles and other disciples didn't get to witness. Um, Peter became, I think, the most important of the original 12 to say of the apostles and I think it's safe to say the most controversial uh, Peter's controversial man but he's also a leader so Peter I think is an apostle that's most like ourselves what do you think I mean by that he wasn't perfect that's exactly right and are we oh boy Lord be with us Paul, Peter was impulsive. Um, Beth used the word uh, earlier. Huh? You forget. <laughs> Impetuous. Okay. Uh, he was impulsive. Uh, he often acted first or spoke first and then many times regretted what he had said. You ever do that? You ever, you know, spout off at the mouth and say, you know, I really wish I hadn't said that. But you know what? When you say something, it's like trying to put toothpaste back into a toothpaste tube, isn't it? Once you've squeezed it out, it's out. 
You can't unring a bell. So we need to be careful what we say. Otherwise, we're going to wind up like Peter a lot, regretting the kind of things that we say. Peter was a rare combination of courage and cowardness. Sometimes he's courageous. Malchus comes up. They're going to arrest Jesus. He takes that sword and flicks the servant's ear off. Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times. And he does. He says, I didn't even know the man. Coward. So in that way, he's kind of like us too, right? Sometimes we're real courageous and sometimes we're not as courageous as we should be. Peter was exactly like most Christians today. He was worldly and spiritual. We are constantly in this Christian life fighting a war of the flesh against the spirit. Peter had that same war going on inside of him for you know, 2,000 years ago, we have that same war going on inside of us every day till the day that we pass from this life. It's going to happen. We're fighting against the flesh. Um, Paul said, I buffet my body daily to try to bring it under control. And that's what we've got to do. It's not easy. Uh, Jesus spoke to Peter more often than any other disciple or any other person, both to correct him <laughs> And to praise him, right? Uh, Peter's name is mentioned in the Gospels. I thought this was interesting. I have, a, um, I have an introduction to the New Testament by Henry Thiessen, an excellent writer. And I, I used some of this, his material in this uh, for uh, the beginning part here when we're just introducing Peter before we get, actually get into the text next week. But he is mentioned in the Gospels more often than any other name other than Jesus. So that makes him a really important and valuable source for us uh, to know about Christianity. Um, there was one redeeming feature of Peter that we should have, and that was his exquisite sense of sin. He knew when he had sinned, and that drove him to do what? That drove him to repent of the things that he had done. So it was said when Peter meets Jesus, after Jesus has given him a load of fish that he didn't expect, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, Luke 5. That's the way Peter felt. Impetuous, sometimes impulsive, sometimes saying and doing things that he knew, that he just absolutely knew was wrong. But he also understood his sin. And so a true sense of sin implies a consciousness. Consciousness of the fact of our sinfulness. We have to look ourselves in the mirror. And I do it every morning when I wash my face and brush my teeth when I first get up. We've got to look ourselves in the mirror and say, I've got to follow Jesus today. That's the one thing we have to do. Once you make that decision every morning that I'm going to follow Jesus, everything else falls into place. But that first thing is you got to follow Jesus. And that means how am I doing? And you got to be honest with yourself. <clears throat> Peter was quick to speak and act. And many times he later regretted what he had said and did. But Peter was also quick to repent. Good example for us, right? <clears throat> when you sin, how do you feel about it? I mean, sometimes we sin and we don't know that we've sinned. Sometimes we'll say something or do something and people take offense at it and we didn't even recognize that it was sin. You know, that's a sin of omission, right? Not commission. We know that we've committed it, but rather we didn't, we didn't realize that. Well, we can't feel anything about that until usually later on you're driving away from a situation and say, oh, why did I say or do that? I just feel so bad about that. Um, what do you do about? What do you do about it when you sin knowingly? Peter repented. What do we do about it in our lives? These are questions we need to be asking ourselves. Do you repent quickly and get back on track? Or do you just ignore it? See, ignoring the sin compounds it. It's kind of like that small snowball uh, at the top of uh, you know, Sugar Mountain. And it starts, and uh, if you ignore it, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger as it rolls down. And then you got a real problem. P 
Peter gives us a really good example of how we should, when we sin, quickly repent, ask for forgiveness, get back on track, get our lives going. Really important to do that. Whenever you see people that are in services for years and years and years and years, and then they're not in services anymore, what they've done is at some point they have ignored their sin. And it's mounted up and they feel guilt, consciously guilt, and they don't know what to do with it and so they just stop coming, which is the worst thing they could do. Because Bible study and worship are the most things we do here at Boiling Springs, bar none. Bible study and worship are the most important things that we do. And we need to keep doing them. Even, that, you know, I have rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm not going to whine on about my arthritis this morning. But there are some mornings that I just don't feel like getting out of bed. My feet and knees and hips and shoulders ache. But you know what? My physical therapist said the lotion is in the motion. you got to keep moving. So I get up. And I take a couple of Tylenol and an ibuprofen and drink some coffee and get going. You know, take my dog for a walk, try to walk her a couple times a day. But, but the point is, sometimes as Christians, we, we quit when we should keep going. And this is the Peter that needs to come out in us. We need to keep going. Get up. Do it. You know, read your Bible. Come to worship. Be in Bible class. Uh, thank God for your meals. You know, keep doing the spiritual things that you need to be doing. And uh, you're going to be far better off than if you quit. So don't quit. Peter was the only apostle that we know of that was married. We don't know if, if any other apostle was married. Uh, scripture doesn't say uh, one way or the other whether he was. Um, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And I'm sure that made Peter's wife feel really good. When that happened in Matthew chapter 8... Um, there are three main features to Peter's personality. And I want you to consider these carefully. I think that they're really good. Number one is the inquisitiveness of Peter. Peter asked more questions than all the other apostles combined. He wants to know. And let me share something with you. A lot of you say, you know, it's hard to set up a Bible study or get a conversation about religion started. If you find somebody that asks questions of you, that's a really good prospect. If they're just apathetic and not asking questions, want to get away from you, that's not a good prospect. But if somebody starts asking questions, if they start asking questions about God, about church, about you as a Christian, that's a really good sign. Questions are a good thing. Peter is asking questions continuously. He wants to learn. He wants to know more. And that's what that's all about. When people ask questions, really good. Uh, Peter also has initiative. I think my study of Peter, and I did a study of him just as an apostle, which, is, which was um, much longer than this introduction. Um, he has ambition and energy and drive. I think he was wired for leadership. I think that's the reason why Jesus called him. Now, he has his faults, he has his sins, but he's wired for leadership. He's asking questions. He's constantly wanting to be involved. And true leaders in any organization are always in the middle of the action. That's what leaders want to do. And leaders are gonna make mistakes. You know, elders, preachers, deacons, we're gonna make mistakes. Sometimes we're gonna disappoint you. You're gonna say, well, I sure wish you'd have done this or that. And, and sometimes, you know, there are just time restraints or something happens where you get interrupted and you just can't do it. But the point is, we want to be involved. And so that's what happens with a Peter type person. They want to be involved. They want to be in the middle of the action. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes you have problems as a result of it. Um, Peter learned that despite his own sinful tendencies, and spiritual weaknesses, boy, watch this point carefully. The Lord still wanted to use him. Let me ask you, this is a great lesson for the 21st century, isn't it? What's the lesson here? Oh. Jesus calls us to do things that are not natural. Turn the other cheek. That's not natural. 
I taught high school for 21 years. I know that's not happening. Because teenagers, if one of them smites one on the face, he's going to be smitten back. Jesus said, don't do that. If a man asks you to walk one mile with you, go with him too. If he wants your tunic, give him the outside garment as well. Jesus calls us to do things that are not natural. So the lesson is, Jesus uses broken human beings to get his will done. Sometimes we rise to the occasion. Sometimes we sin and have to repent. But that's, we are all God has got because Jesus died for us. And the result is we can be his servants. I tell you, that's a, that's, a, a, a wonderful lesson that we learn from Peter right there. Uh, Peter is dominant in the first 12 chapters of Acts. Um, Peter prompted the choice of the 12th apostle in Acts chapter 1. Whenever Judas Iscariot, of course, had committed suicide and uh, was no longer part of the apostleship. Uh, Peter is also the leader on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. He stands up and speaks up and preaches the first sermon. Which, by the way, if you want to um, understand about who Jesus is, go back and read that sermon. Sometimes we think, well, I've heard of Acts 2.38 all of my life, blah, blah, blah. You know, no, read the whole chapter. The chapter is so powerful the material that he's got there. Uh, and he goes into the background of Jesus. He goes back to David and he talks about who Jesus was. And then he tells them what they've done. And then he tells them what to do as a result of what they've done. And then he talks about the fellowship at the beginning of the church after the first 3,000 were baptized. Uh, Peter and John are together early in Acts. But it's really interesting, isn't it? One of my favorite statements, you'll hear me use it a lot. One of my favorite statements is God edits severely. If John said, if we had everything that Jesus had done written down, there weren't enough books to cover it. So God edits severely. The Bible is only 66 books. You know, it's just not that long. So he gives us what we need and no more. So here in Acts, you read about Peter and John working together, but Luke never records even one word that John said. It's always Peter, especially for the first uh, 12 chapters. The apostles in general and Peter specifically are involved in dramatic healings in Acts. Watch this. This is really powerful scripture. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were among the people. And they were all with one accord on Solomon's porch. So they're right there at the temple. Yet none of them dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them in beds and couches. At least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from around the cities in Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Acts chapter 5 is an amazing chapter. So powerful. And then what happens? Peter and John are arrested and put in jail. That's what happens. So not everybody appreciated all this, but the power that uh, Jesus gave to them whenever he left was the power to preach his word. How do you get people to listen to what you're saying? Well, you know what? If you, hire, if you uh, heal my mother-in-law, I'm going to listen to what you're saying. You know? You heal my brother or my cousin or my whatever. You do that, I'm going to begin listening to what you're saying because your message obviously is very powerful. Peter was sent to Samaria uh, just quickly uh, where people were being converted to the preaching of Philip in uh, Acts chapter 8. Uh, Peter raised Tabitha from the dead, Acts chapter 9. Peter appeared in missionary activities in Lydda, Joppa, and Caesarea, Acts chapter 9 again. And Peter led Cornelius and his household uh, where they were taught and baptized in Acts chapter 10. So Peter is really the main focus. Other apostles are mentioned, but he's the focus the first 12 chapters. Paul mentions Peter in Galatians chapter 2, and here's one of the mistakes that Peter made. Peter brings the disciples, excuse me, the Gentiles into the church. He's eating with them. He's fellowshipping with them. And then he goes to Antioch, and some Jews 
Pharisees, I'm going to take it, come to Antioch and they say, what are you doing? You're eating with Gentiles. And Peter stops eating with Gentiles and Paul calls him on the carpet. Paul said, no, 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 no. That's hypocrisy. If you're going to eat with Gentiles, you got to do it everywhere in front of everyone. And I don't care. Okay. You've got to do it right. So Paul calls Peter on the carpet. And we've got to assume that Peter repented as a result of that. But he was being playing the part of Hippocrates, the, the hypocrite. Um, he was the person that was doing the wrong thing. And Paul said, get your act together, Peter. So, wow. Imagine what that was like. One apostle calling another apostle on the carpet. Wow. That must have been quite a conversation, right? Uh, to see that happen. And uh, Paul did that with Peter, and I think Peter uh, got straightened out as a result of that. Having been in prison two times, <clears throat> and beaten, by the way, Acts 5 and Acts chapter 12, Peter left Jerusalem and, for Antioch and possibly points east. I think there's a point that we miss a lot whenever we're talking about uh, the beginning of the church. The church really was begun in eastern Asia and Eastern Europe. It was not strongest in Italy and parts in Spain and, and, and Western Europe. The apostles, and I've done a study of all 12 apostles, uh, at least 10 of them went east rather than west. Now Paul, of course, uh, is a possible exception to that. And I think uh, Peter, however, went to the east a lot. So you're talking about um, Constantinople, first called Byzantium. You're talking about Turkey, the area we call Turkey today. All of those provinces of Rome that are in there. It's really interesting to see how the church is spread originally in the east and then later on it comes to, uh, to the west. So there's an approximate timeline, and no timeline that you have in the New Testament is going to be perfect, but uh, this timeline is good. Uh, Acts chapter 2, Pentecost 30, might be 33, I don't know. I always use 30 as the date because if you go back on the calendar and study him, Jesus was actually born uh, 3 or 4 B.C., the way we set it up. So uh, Acts chapter 8, Peter and John are in Samaria. Acts chapter 10, Peter teaches uh, Cornelius. Acts chapter 12, something interesting happens. Peter is arrested in Jerusalem. And then after the angel comes and releases him, Peter goes, and here God's editing uh, severely again. He doesn't tell us where he goes. He just says Peter went to another city. What does that mean? Well, we don't know what it means. There's a time lapse of about six years where we don't hear anything at all about Peter. And then in Acts chapter 15, he shows up at the Jerusalem conference along with Paul and Barnabas and the other uh, 11 apostles. So Peter surfaces after six years. Where he was during that six years, we don't know. It could be that he's preaching in some of the places that he's going to mention in the first few verses of 1 Peter. Could be that he's preaching. Because there were places, remember, Paul did not go to every place in the east in his missionary journeys. There were other places. Um, Galatians chapter 2, we talked about uh, Peter meets Paul in Antioch and Paul calls him on the carpet. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes to the Corinthian uh, Christians. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes from Rome. We know it was from Rome. Matter, matter of fact, the 1 Peter is one of the best uh, confirmed books and one of the earliest confirmed books of the New Testament. So we know that where he wrote from. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes 2 Peter in around 66 or 67, again from Rome where he's imprisoned, and he's going to be executed uh, during Nero's reign in 66 or 67. Um, here's a point that I think we need to make. This is important that we make this. A common tradition that Peter founded the church at Rome cannot, and I've got it underlined, be verified historically or scripturally. My own personal opinion is Acts chapter 2 and that huge list of people that Luke writes down who were present at the, uh, the day of Pentecost when Peter is preaching, there were people there from Rome. I think they went back to Rome and that's how the church got started. It wasn't Peter. We can't prove that historically or uh, scripturally. There's no serious attempt by any reputable scholar 
to find the presence of Peter in Rome before Paul wrote the book of Romans in 56. You can't prove that he was there scripturally uh, or historically before that time. Paul names 35 Christians. Ladies, you remember from the ladies class that I taught to you all, there are 35 people listed in, Acts, in Romans chapter 16. Could Paul have named so many Christians and left Peter out? I don't think so. Peter's an apostle. He would have been mentioned if he was, uh, had been there. One thing is certain. Paul was the first apostle to arrive in Rome, and he arrived in chains. Acts chapter 26. He was a prisoner whenever he got there. Uh, Paul stated in 2 Timothy 4 that no one came to his defense when he first stood trial before Nero. Talking about Paul. No one came to his defense. Now, my logic tells me we've got to believe that if Peter would have come to Paul's defense, if he'd have been in Rome, right? Would he have not come to his defense? Uh, I think Peter was courageous enough by this point. He would have come to his defense. So uh, I think... And this, you're going to find that I do this a lot in class. A lot of what we learn, of course, from Scripture, but some of it's common sense. God expects us to use uh, what one of my old professors say, use your noodle, you know, what's between your ears. Sometimes things are just common sense. Uh, the conclusion is that Peter was never in Rome until sometime after Paul's first acquittal. I'm of the opinion, some people are not, I'm of the opinion that Paul went to Rome, he w went on trial, he was acquitted, and he got out and he preached for a while, and then he came back to Rome, arrested, and he was, uh, his second time in Rome is when he was uh, executed. And um, I think I've got some scriptures and history that backs that up, but that's my feeling about it. So um, Peter was never in Rome until sometime after Paul's first acquittal. First and second Peter are part of these general letters. And I told you that I really like them uh, a lot, the general letters, towards the back of the New Testament, you know. New Testament came seven letters written by four leaders in the early church. Uh, James, Peter, Jude, and who's the other one? John, thank you. <clears throat> y'all, I tell you what, y'all are a sharp bunch. You just need to speak up a little bit more. <clears throat> First Peter claims to be written by Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, 1-1. One, one. Uh, that is Cephas, Simon Peter, Simon and Barjona, all the same person. And I know for some of you that drives you crazy that somebody has more than one name. Right? My name is Mark. Some people call me Mark. Some people call me Marshall. Some people call me things that I shouldn't repeat in class because <clears throat> I taught high school for 21 years. So, you know, you name it, I've been called it at some point or another, but I prefer not to be called by any of those. But there's his names. So he, he mentioned Seaman, uh, Cephas, uh, Simon Peter, Simon Barjona, Peter. That's all the same person. And I know sometimes that drives people nuts. There's no book in the New Testament which has earlier or better or stronger evidence and confirmation. <clears throat> the ultimate source of all scripture, of course, is deity. 2 Timothy 3, uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. There's no need for me to go in detail about that. We believe in verbal inspiration of the scripture here, I believe. Uh, God is the source of, uh, or the origin of what's recorded in Scripture. God, through the Holy Spirit, used human authors to write what he revealed in the Bible. Um, but writers were not copyist. Um, they were not just copyist or uh, transcribers. The Holy Spirit guided and controlled the writers of Scripture who used their own vocabularies and styles, but wrote only what the Holy Spirit intended. The Bible is verbally inspired. And, and here, it's correct to say that Peter wrote this book, but Silas, a.k.a. Silvanus, here's somebody else with two names, assisted Peter as his secretary, maybe as much as an amanuensis, which means uh, you listen to someone when they're dictating to you and you make corrections as they go. Silas was one of the chief men in scripture, Acts chapter 15. Also Tertius. Now, when I taught the ladies class in Romans chapter 16, we talked about Tertius. Tertius is not a name. Tertius is three, the number three in Latin. And Tertius was a slave and he didn't have a name. He had a number. So there's old, there's old Tertius, number three. He doesn't have a, a real name. 
But he becomes the recorder, transcriber, secretary, amanuensis, whatever you want to call it, writing for the book of Romans. Uh, Romans 16, 22, I, Tertius, write this letter, greet you in the Lord. You know, Paul historically had bad eyesight. I think that uh, he did some writing because he says, I, in my own hand, I've written it down. But I think most of the time he used somebody to write for him. And 1 Peter 5, 12, by Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I account him, I've written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. So Silvanus, our Silas, does the same thing for Peter that Tertius did for Paul. Peter was a fisherman, and I think he probably went to school like most Jewish boys did up to about age 12, and then they would begin learning whatever the trade of their father or grandfather was. So Silas was, I think, not only the bearer of this letter, but I think through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote down and corrected Peter's phraseology because Peter was not that well educated. So the message of Peter has been directed by the Holy Spirit, of course, but he can use uh, Silas as well. When we write, every individual has their own unique voice. This is, uh, this is always funny to me, and I can't spend a lot of time with it because we're coming down to our time, but students are always amazed when teachers or professors charge them with plagiarism. Stealing somebody else's writing and writing it down as if it were their own, you know? And by the way, in this class, I will try to be as much as I can academically honest with things, the way I present them and where I've gotten them from. But, but as a teacher or a professor, when you have read hundreds and thousands of papers, I can tell when the voice changes in the paper. If you write the first page and it's your writing, the second page is plagiarized, it's going to sound different. It's called writing in your voice. And so immediately, as soon as it changes, I think, oh, they have plagiarized something. I just have to find where it came from. Now, AI makes it har harder. You know, artificial intelligence makes it harder. But the problem is students don't realize, although they don't like to admit it, that we, the teacher, really know more than they do about the subject matter. And as a result, we can pick out plagiarism pretty fast. I felt really bad for one student I had at Charleston Southern uh, University. She was an Air Force retiree. She was going back to get her bachelor's degree. She turned in a paper. It were only five-page research papers. It wasn't a bad deal at all. And on the second page, she had copied straight from Wikipedia. I mean, it was obvious. And now I've got to confront her with that. You know? So I go. first thing I did was go to my department chair in history. I said, okay. She's plagiarized this. Do you agree? And he looks at the evidence. Yeah, she plagiarized it. All right, now I got to go back to her and I got to give her a choice. I can fail her in the class. I can give her a zero and fail her right now. She can't pass the class. I can do that. Or later on, I can say, you just get a zero on that, but you got to do well in the next three tests to pass the class. Or you can drop the class, whichever you want to. She decided that she stuck it out and she wound up making a C. I was kind of generous anyway. But she, she learned that you can't copy other people, okay? All right, we're going to stop right there, and we'll finish up some things uh, next week.